Thank you. Thank you to this church, to Pastor uh, Mike, to Pastor Jackie, uh, to the planning team who invited me to come here. I know there's a lot of hard work goes into a series like this, and it really is a privilege for me to be here. Um, I offered the planning committee several different topics, whether that be history or theology, mission evangelism. But what I'm finding when I offer these, these different potential courses or seminars that this is the one that 90% of, the, of groups ask for, Christian encounters with world religions. Uh, and I think that says quite a lot about the curiosity that we have in this particular topic in this particular time. Uh, so I would encourage you over these next few weeks to, to be curious. Curiosity is going to guide us through this next few weeks. So six weeks is a long time. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. I'm hoping that we'll be able to generate some really good conversations that can take place not just on a Sunday morning, but I'm free and open to conversations in the week as well. If you have particular questions, then you can either find your way to the planning committee and you can give them some of those questions and they can make sure that that comes to me because this six-week course is, is moldable. I can change directions in different ways uh, to accommodate... Uh, the things that you would like. Does that make sense? So be open to that as we go. I know this might not be very clear, but these are my, my children. This is Julie, my, my wife, who's uh, getting ready for worship as we speak. Lydia and Nathan. Uh, we actually met at the World Council of Churches in Zimbabwe in 1998. I was there working uh, for three years with the government of Zimbabwe on uh, HIV, AIDS, education with the street children. So that was a real, a real privilege for me, but it was also a deconstruction of this assumed theology that I had, being a part of the church growing up. It was a real deconstruction that I've had to reconstruct since then. We met in Harare in Zimbabwe, and then two years later, met again in Fort Worth, uh, just at a luncheon, and we looked at each other and said, Do we, have we met? Shall we go on a date? And a few weeks later, we were married. <laughs> From there, we headed to India to work in the Church of South India, and of course, to be in India, you are immersed in uh, a world of religious plurality, different cultures, different religious flavors. Uh, that was a part of the Christian identity in that place. So again, a real privilege uh, to be there. Uh, I've also spent time working in Fort Worth, Texas, again working with, with uh, neglected children. Those experiences, though, in Zimbabwe, working with these children, uh, that deconstruction that I was talking about, it, it headed me to seminary. I thought that the, the, the questions that I had needed to be answered in a Christian context, so therefore a Christian seminary seemed to be the best place to be. And so I went with all of these rather tough questions of life on the streets in Zimbabwe, in southern Africa. And what I realized was that the answers that I was getting to my questions were not what I expected. So some of the great heroes, some of the great activists that I got to, to learn about in seminary... I realized that, that if you push beneath the surface of those thinkers, they're all deeply connected uh, to the interfaith movement. So, for example, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. there is marching next to his good friend, Rabbi Heschel. Uh, this is a man who is, is steeped in interfaith conversation, although he understands what he is doing in the civil rights, certainly born within the Christian context, he is open to discourse and dialogue, essentially beyond that realm also. It's interesting that after he won the Nobel Peace Prize, when he was asked who does he think should get it next, he turned to the Buddhist community and said he thought Thich Nhat Hanh should be the next recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize which suggests to us that he's clearly versed in the things that Thich Nhat Hanh had been doing. When we look at Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. only in the context of Christianity, then I think we miss something about who he thought he was and what he thought and was doing at the time. On the right there, you... Who is that? 
Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Of course, I know that with Pastor Mike, you've been looking at some of Bart's theology, and I'm sure Bonhoeffer's theology too. I was so inspired by Bonhoeffer that I, uh, when I wrote to the University of Edinburgh, uh, I, my thesis title that they said yes to was Bonhoeffer's interest in India. He's written letters. He was invited by Gandhi to go to India to learn about the nonviolent resistance movement there, and he wanted to go. Now, he didn't ever have the chance to do it. But he wrote to his grandmother that he thought that the questions that he had could be answered perhaps best in the context of religious plurality in India. He was disappointed when he came to the United States. He didn't feel like his questions were answered uh, particularly well, in a couple of cases perhaps. But he thought it was India that was the place that he would go to actually find the best answers to the questions he was raising. Now, whether that's true or not, it's not really the point of what I'm trying to bring forward. He recognized the need for an interfaith paradigm to understand his Christian identity and theology. And of course, where he perhaps separates from Bart, or the challenge when he came to be a part of, uh, in writing the Barman Declaration that Bart had scripted, Bonhoeffer was really keen to ask what he called the Jewish question. Recognizing what was going on at that time, even prior to 1934, the persecution of the Jews was apparent. And this was a question that would guide Bonhoeffer in very different directions with his theological exploration. Wilfred Cantrell Smith is the chap on the lower left here. This is a man who had spent many years in India before partition in 1948. And there he was working harmoniously with Sikhs, with Muslims, with Christians, with other uh, religious groups. And then after partition in 1948, all of a sudden Lahore was in chaos. He went back to visit and couldn't believe that the people that he had spent time working with for so long in peace and harmony had now turned on each other in their religious identity groupings and caused such carnage. Of course, that was a troubling time, that partition, the movement of Muslims into what would then be Pakistan, and so on and so forth. So for me as a seminary student, not particularly interested in the interfaith movement, I was realizing that these people who I was drawn to to learn more about their theological quest, their theological questions, and they were showing me that their world was very much an interfaith world. It was the interfaith questions or the questions that were coming from their interactions with other people that formed their theological grounding. Those were the questions that they were asking to help shape their own understanding of Christian theology, Christian identity, Christian discipleship, and of course, therefore, Christian mission. So I knew from that point that, uh, that the interfaith movement was going to be something that I would be interested in. So what are we doing in this series? Let's just put it out there in, in, on the screen. In this series over the next six weeks, we venture into the complex and invigorating world of interreligious encounters with an emphasis on the encounters. The 20th century witnessed a crisis in Christian mission shaped in part by the renaissance of world religions. So during this six-week series, we will investigate how our understanding of mission, Christian mission, has been critically challenged on the anvil of religious encounters. And we will investigate Christian encounters with these different traditions. Uh, and I'd thrown a range of, of traditions out to the committee, and these were the ones that, uh, that we worked out between us. But again, there's movement. So if there's a tradition that you really, really want to, to learn something about those encounters, we can perhaps incorporate that. When you go to Union Presbyterian Seminary, the campus either in Charlotte or in Richmond, you will see this uh, dotted around all over. Uh, you might not be able to see it very clearly here, but it says, for the church in the world... For the church in the world seems to be the new mantra of Union Presbyterian Seminary, at least. It's framing the curriculum, it's framing the things we do, it's framing the courses that we teach. The question of the church in the world is prevalent. So when we look into that world, if we're going to take that seriously, the reality is that that world is very diverse. We know this. Even in our own local communities, the demographics are changing very rapidly. 
Now it's very, well, it's much more common, certainly, uh, for interfaith marriages to take place. Uh, In fact, the numbers are are, are quite quite incredible. And and I'm not talking about Methodists marrying Baptists or um, (laughs) Presbyterians. I'm talking about, you know, Jews marrying Christians, um, Muslims marrying Hindus, etc., etc. You get that. So it's fascinating when, when a couple comes to the church, one is perhaps Christian from your particular denomination, wants to be married in the church, and is marrying somebody from the Hindu tradition. What, what, what do we do? Do we have the, the vocabulary? Do we have the grace to be able to deal with that conversation in a very wholesome and healthy way? Or do we just bury our heads in the sand? I don't think we can do that. So the context is, is very much the world that Union Presbyterian Seminary says it's interested in getting to know is very much diverse. Diana Eck wrote this book, How a, a New Religious America, How a Christian Country Has Become the World's Most Religiously Diverse Nation in the World. Now, she might not be correct, but I, that's not the point. The fact is that things have been changing, certainly over the 20th century. So what do we do with that? Um, these are the questions that we will uh, bring our curiosity to. One of the classes that I teach at Union Presbyterian Seminary is Christian Encounters with World Religions. And it's an elective course, so it's not a required course. It's just for those who are particularly interested in this topic. And generally, the students come in thinking it's going to be somewhat of a peripheral class. You know, a kind of add-on extra, it might be interesting, it might be a little bit of a less of a harsh load than some of the other classes. But what they find as they go through that semester is just how, how that's not true. How this is not a peripheral course, but actually engages us in the very heart of the questions that we're asking, of theological discourse. It comes right into the center And we'll see why that's the case as we go through this next few weeks. It is not just a peripheral subject that the churches, our churches, can just have as a kind of a secondary, a possibility, an interesting thing to talk about in a certain window of time. No, it's going to, we're going to find that it comes into the heart of all that we are and all that we do. So let me set up a little tension here. A tension from the start of the 20th century. So as we turn into the 20th century, I'm going to bookend that century with a couple of things that are taking place. And you might have heard of some of these uh, councils. The first one, the World Parliament of Religions. Put your hands up if you've heard of the World Parliament of Religions. Fabulous. Has anybody been to the World Parliament of Religions? <laughs> this, was, this was in Chicago, 1893, just prior to the turn of the century. And this was an opportunity for folks from different religious traditions around the world to come and to showcase their traditions. Well, there's a chap called Swami Vivekananda who came and he presented at this this, uh, parliament. And it was dominated by Christian voices. But Swami Vivekananda stood there and talked about and encouraged a new era of tolerance, religious tolerance. Get to know one another. Let's be in dialogue one another. When he finished speaking, everybody stood up and kept clapping for about 10, 11 minutes. Well, it's a long time anyway. (laughs) What that tells us is that at least those who were gathered welcomed that, that new possibility. Welcomed the new opportunities that that kind of space might create here in the United States. Certainly in the Chicago region. So if we just flip to the other side of the century, we get to a very famous conference that took place in Edinburgh, Scotland. This was the world, the first world mission conference. And at the mission conference, there was also great excitement from those gathered. But from John Mott's book here, we can see that this became a catchphrase for the conference. The evangelization of the world in this generation. The evangelization of the world in this generation. Mission, mission, mission. Let's take this message, let's take it on the road, and let's spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, if you notice, these two, these two great and world, of course, they're limited in their scope, world conferences don't sit very easily next to each other. Religious toleration, dialogue, recognizing and in the enrichment of plurality... 
Next two, mission, 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 evangelism. Evangelize the world in the name of Christ. How do those two sit together? It took me a long time to find out if anybody went to both conferences. Yeah. And actually, John Mott did. He, and in, I think one probably informed the other. So I want to pose a question. Of those two stalwart conferences that took place prior to and after the 20th century began, which would win the century? Which one of those, the, those, the ethos of those conferences is going to win the 20th century? Let's just ponder that for a moment. Well, if we think about it, we could, we could suggest that it's the former. The World Parliament of religion, Religions wins the century. Why can we say that? Because of the great resurgence of world religions that we know about. And in fact, a lot of the great resurgence of world religions perhaps happened as a result of the initial move, the 19th century mission movement, in which missionaries spread around the world, and folks from different parts of the world said, well, what do we do with this now? Do we all just convert to Christianity? Many said, no, we're not going to do that. But let's find it within ourselves to have a renaissance within our own traditions. Christianity is not the only factor, but it's certainly one that has led to a great resurgence of world religions into the 20th century. Again, the figures are staggering. This is from David Kerr, a mentor of mine at the University of Edinburgh. This is 100 years, 100 years ago. It was commonly argued in the West that Islam could not survive the 20th century. It just could not survive the 20th century. Oops. They got that wrong. So we need to be careful about making too many clear-cut projections. Leslie Newbegin is a, is a world-renowned theologian. He was a missionary in India for many, many years. He was a bishop in the Church of South India. And he says this. The famous watchword from John Mott, the evangelization of the world in this generation that was declared in 1910. And John Mott, again, received rapturous applause from the crowds who bought into that very ethos, was a typical example of imperialism. It is inappropriate for today's world. He's talking at the end of the 20th century. For our grandparents who were ignorant of the spiritual riches of the great world religions, the idea that these were all to be displaced by a triumphant Christianity was excusable. It is not excusable today. This is a missionary in the church, steeped in the church, clothed in the church, who is able to say something like this. Actually, Newbegin is going to challenge this very premise, but he sets it up so he can challenge it. But in other words, he says this has become the new orthodoxy, that it's not excusable today. When we think about global mission, let's go with Dana Roberts, a great uh, historian and missiologist. She says that from the 1950s through to the 1970s, as nations shook off the legacy of European domination, churches around the world accused Western missionaries, United States and Europe, of paternalism, racism, and cultural imperialism. We know this. We know this story. We should know this story because it's going to frame our discourse in mission. The refrain, missionary go home, reached its peak in the 1970s. Missionary, go home. Now, in some places, that was a very, it was a, a nice thank you. We appreciate you. Please go home. We've got this now. In other places, it was go home or you will be forced to go home. What that meant was, though, that missionaries were coming back, having been sent with that, that euphoria of going out to evangelize, having to come home and say it didn't work. It failed. It was a failed mission. And in different parts of the world, that story is very, very different. But the thread seemed to be that what we intended didn't happen. The goals that we set, at least, were not successful. And so, for many years after the 1970s, as Stan Skreslet says, the idea of mission appeared obsolete, if not an outright threat to world peace. The word mission became problematic. It came out of seminary courses. 
courses introduction to mission and orientation to mission before you go out on the mission field this is what you need to learn mission was taken out why because we didn't know what to do with it it had become really tricky it was almost a, this a consciousness that we have to pull it out and say what do we mean by mission were our goals right in the first place do we have to reevaluate and have a language event about what do we even mean by mission it's one of those words that we throw around so easily, assuming everybody knows what we're talking about, assuming that everybody means the same thing. We do that with other words too. Salvation, even grace. These words, I think we need a language event to be able to reclaim those and say, what do we actually mean when we talk about that? Which would win the day? Well... Just this, uh, in 2018, we had the World Parliament of Religions in Toronto. Uh, over 8,000 people gathered, but there was a global uh, outreach. Folks could, in the digital age, sign in from wherever they were in the world and listen to the seminars. But look what they, look what they promised. This is 118 spiritual and secular groups coming together for the promise of inclusion and the power of love. Pursuing global understanding, reconciliation, and change. I wonder if those words, that title, we could just take that out and put it onto a missionary conference. Boom. Same words. This language that we're talking about is, does not belong to Christianity. It never has belonged to Christianity. So what, we do, what do we do with that? And we'll find, I don't know if you are a part of the Charter for Compassion. Are, are you a part of the, Mike, are you part of the Charter for Compassion? It's actually a, it's a wonderful, wonderful group. And the, the, the senior highs in my Sunday school class were really gripped by this. Uh, it's it's a, a broad spectrum into interfaith, beyond interfaith, into the secular realm as well. But people coming together on that theme of compassion. And our senior highs were saying, look, we, we get that. We get that language. We would rather sign up for that than the particularities of Christianity. Because it's a language we understand in our schools and in our homes, uh, our communities that are very diverse. It's great appeal for this kind of language. And we recognize that the golden rule is also not something that belongs to Christianity. It is out there and it is, it is entrenched in the DNA of other religious traditions. Back to Leslie Newbegin. He says, and again he's going to challenge this, but he puts it out there. An aggressive claim on the part of one of the world religions, i.e. Christianity... To have the truth for all can only be regarded as treason against the human race. And this is what he says is the new orthodox position. To try and claim this truth, this exclusive truth within one particular tradition is a treason to humanity. This is what he considers to be the popular perception at least. And again, Newbegin is going to write to challenge that to say it doesn't need to be that way. But we'll look at that in these weeks. What's our options? What's our options? Of course this is an option. But if you're doing that, look what the rest of us have got to see. <laughs> Not so sure about that. What's another option? Another option is to just to say, okay... You know, it's, it's clear that now uh, for us to claim Christianity with some, some boundaries is, is not the way forward anymore. Let's just uh, enter what, uh, what um, is sometimes referred to as the fruit salad. Yeah, where you get folks together from different traditions and you talk. You talk to each other about issues. But what's lost is the flavorings from each particular tradition. We kind of leave our traditions and our ideas and our thoughts at the door and we come in and we share good fellowship time. That common ground, if you like. Uh, Stanley Samata talks about this as the fruit salad being that, you know, you have these delicious flavors, the strawberry and the kiwi and the banana, and they all have their unique individual flavors. But when you put them together and you put them in your mouth, it just becomes a mush. 
It's a mush. You can't quite taste the strawberry anymore because it's come, become mixed with everything else. Well, I think in the context of what we're talking about this next six weeks, this is, this is not a plausible response either. Um, we've tried both of those. I think there's going to be something in the middle. Just building on, on that fruit salad idea, Kate McCarthy and her work on the interfaith movement in the United States said that uh, her research on interfaith marriage, actually, she says that when two come together, particularly somebody from a Christian tradition and somebody from a different tradition, what happens is that usually it, it's a case of the amazing disappearing Jesus. Even though they go in with good intentions to say when we have our children, we will raise them maybe in both traditions. How, uh, the options, of course, are many. Oftentimes, it's the Christian who starts to, to allow Jesus to recede because that seems to be the biggest stumbling block between the two. And Kate McCarthy says this is too high a price for the interfaith movement, this idea of the amazing disappearing Jesus, as though we have to do that before we can engage in the interfaith movement. I think that's an unacceptable, I agree with Kate McCarthy, move. So when we ask that question, which would win the day or the century, certainly there could be a case for uh, the reality of religious plurality. But I'm not sure it's the right question. In fact, I know it's not the right question. Because does it have to be a competition where one has victory over the other? Now, I know it's not the right question. I'm not exactly sure what the right question is. But I think it's along the lines of how do, we, how do those both sit together? In the reality of interreligious plurality, is there scope too to be able to also talk very, very humbly but very boldly about mission? So it's the wrong question. Which will win the day? Because the reality is that for Christianity too, despite those knocks, despite those bumps... Even though missionaries were told to go home, when they came home, they didn't just give it up and say, right, where's the fruit salad? They said, it means this much to us. Let's evaluate what we mean by mission. Let's get back into the scriptures. Let's revitalize this conversation from within the church so that we do have a response to it when we go back out. Not necessarily back out to the place we've just come from in the world, but maybe just into our community. A passion for that curiosity, for that theological uh, study, for those conversations to take place. So we have at the start of the 21st century, two great councils that take place. Again, global councils. One is the centenary, Edinburgh 2010, the centenary of that great 1910 conference, which was the birth of the ecumenical movement, if you like, in the 20th century. What's the focus of that conference, global conference? Mission. This is the ecumenical side of the church, if you like. The evangelical side of the church also wanted to do a global conference. They did theirs in Cape Town in South Africa in 2010. What was the focus of theirs? Mission. And actually, one of the beautiful things about that, I was part of some of the planning team for Edinburgh 2010, was that at first, those two conferences were going to collide date-wise. But the evangelical side of the church, and that's too simply put, but said, look, we will, we will step back and encourage you and support you in what you are doing within the ecumenical movement, and we will change the date of ours. Uh, after some of the tensions between the ecumenical movement and the evangelical movement in the 20th century, that's quite a phenomena. But I think they could do that. They could do that and encourage and support one another because they recognize that, yes, mission is at the crux of this as we enter the 21st century. They could have picked anything to have as their focus points but they came back to mission and said this is it Hmm. I'm going to leave definitions of mission to next week actually if that's okay Uh, but because it's a tricky thing it's a tricky thing to do in fact if I could define it so easily then we wouldn't need to be here I'd just tell you and then we would all go and play some basketball with the guys who are coming later. <laughs> but let me just say, perhaps, perhaps the, when we think about the great ends of the church, it's in here that we're going to find some really good answers, some really healthy and wholesome answers in there. So we will come back to this uh, again. But here's my claim. This is, this is 
my opinion, this is my perspective, and it's this. That involvement in the interfaith movement provides dynamic opportunities for two things. One, for Christian enrichment. Of course we can get Christian enrichment when we just talk to one another. Of course we can. But I think that participation in the interfaith movement essentially gives us an opportunity for incredible identity enrichment. And, and here's, that, here's the, the next part, and mission in the 21st century. Now that's, that's a troubling word to put in the context of the interfaith movement. Because the word mission and interfaith movement, again, don't go hand in hand together. There is a great, and rightly so, suspicion of anybody who will come into the interfaith group and start to be coercive. To start to abuse the respect of the space, of the common ground. So it's going to be a little tricky that I'm even adding that word in there, but I think it's an essential word for us to consider in this context. Involvement in the interfaith movement provides dynamic opportunities for Christian enrichment and mission in the 21st century. Our great Jewish friends, the Three Stooges, they can help us. Here's three challenges. Three challenges, and there's many more, but uh, bear with me just uh, narrowing this down to three. The first is this. This is, uh, I love this, pictures of people leaving the church. In other words, how do we get people to leave when they won't leave? There's things to do on a Sunday afternoon, and people are just not leaving. So we can start singing, shine, Jesus, shine. That'll get rid of a few. We can jangle the keys, all of this. But I think in in all honesty, our problem is not how to get rid of folks from the church. Our problem is how to be open and inviting for people to come into the church. We know the figures. They're they're difficult. Now, I'm not saying that as a pessimist. I'm saying that as an optimist. I think there's things we can do. Why? Because there's things that God does. These figures here. This 7,600, and the figures are not exactly accurate. We can always be critical of them. 7,600 people is the number of people leaving the church every day in the West. For a whole variety of different reasons. Uh, Even if the figure's not so accurate, it's out by 100 here or there a particular day. That's not the point. The point is that's a lot of people who are choosing to leave the church for whatever reason. When we think about this figure on the other side, 23,000, this is the number of people who are joining the church every day in the continent of Africa. And again, let's not focus on the figures. But even if we're out by a little bit, that's a challenge for us in this context in the United States, surely. Within that, Christianity has been perceived as being judgmental, hypocritical, out of touch, boring, exclusive, and the antithesis of love. Judgmental, hypocritical, out of touch. This is churchgoers saying this. This is not folks who have left. This is folks who have stayed in, particularly youth. This was uh, someone you can't see it very well. He's fallen asleep at one of my sermons. So uh, <laughs> be glad I'm not preaching uh, as well. The second challenge is this. Knowledge of our own religious faith. Now I know not, that's not the case here because I see, see all the things and see some of the classes that are, are advertised in this particular church. So we can glance over this. But generally speaking... Uh, we have become so inarticulate about our faith. As I said earlier, even the words that we use that are very common have become troublesome. We don't really know what we mean by them. And certainly when we're pushed and asked about them, well, we want to run and hide. One of the reasons that, that is given why people don't get involved in the interfaith movement is they do not want to be put in that awkward position where somebody says, well, what, is, what does a Christian say about this? Nobody wants to be put in an awkward position where they have to fumble and articulate themselves. Stephen Prothero is a professor. He teaches religious studies. uh, And he gives his students who are coming in, many from a particularly Christian context, he gives them just a quiz, just a vocabulary quiz. And this is some of his, his findings. 
that only half of Americans can name the fourth go- four Gospels. Only one third knew that Jesus delivered the Sermon on the Mount. One quarter thought that the book of Acts was in the Old Testament. And a third said they just didn't know. And my personal favorite, 10% of Americans believed Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. I think he's pulling our leg a little bit, maybe. But we get the point. Inarticulate about our faith. What do we say? And yet we are challenged by scripture. Always be ready to give a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. There's a lot in there, by the way. But always be ready. Always be ready not to run. Third challenge, the perception from outside Christianity. We've heard about the perception from within Christianity. The perception from outside. Captured brilliantly by this man, Mahatma Gandhi. I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. This is one of the reasons why in this particular context, missionaries were asked to go home. Religious conversion is the deadliest poison that ever sapped the fountain of truth. Again, in his context, the way that the Christians were carrying out their ideas and trying to fulfill their goals seemed to be inappropriate in the context of India seeking to become, uh, uh, to shed the, the shackles of colonial rule. Crisis or opportunity? Well, I wouldn't be here if it was just a crisis. I wouldn't be here unless it was an opportunity. The interfaith movement, I think, has something to offer for enrichment of Christian identity, for enrichment of Christian language, to be able to talk with other people about our faith, clumsily perhaps, but still nonetheless. And also an opportunity in being able to do so, to be in the realm of Christian mission. So let's just quickly journey through the book of Acts. Uh, I'm not going to go to the very popular, uh, often... I was preached about the story of Paul in, in Athens that, because we know that. That's our usual go-to. So let's see where we go. The Acts of the Apostles is we consider the principal New Testament source for seeing the emergence of the church's first understanding of itself. It's the formation of the early church. But it isn't this. It's not that the church is formed, thank you very much, in Jerusalem. Now let's go. As a secondary thing, let's go and talk about it. It's the other way around. Disciples go, apostles go, people talk about Jesus in so many different contexts. And it's in that that the church is forming. It's understanding itself, it's understanding Jesus in new ways. I just said that. Oh, the church, missionary by its very nature. This is one of the theses that I'm going to bring back time and again. The church is missionary by its very nature. It is not church. And then if it has the resources, if it has the know-how, if it has the expertise, it can start to form a mission committee. No. How many people come to a church and say, I want to learn about mission. And they ask somebody in the pews and that person says, oh, go and find Jennifer. She's the chair of the mission committee. Why can't you? Why? What? As we journey through the book of Acts, as we imagine it being performed on a stage like this, the opening chapters, the opening scene will be very Jewish. It's uh, everything on the stage you see will be related to Judaism. We know this. So exposure to foreign religious influences becomes an essential part of Christian identity construction. Let me read that again. Exposure to foreign religious influences, crossing boundaries, becomes an essential part of Christian identity construction. Developed through the levels of attraction and repulsion within those encounters, the more Christianity was exposed to different religious influences, the stronger her sense of identity becomes. We get this from the book of Acts. So the disciples asked Jesus, Acts chapter 1, Lord, is this the time you will restore the kingdom to Israel? They want this scene to stay very much within Judaism. Maybe with some 
tweaking to it, perhaps. But it's still a Jewish stage. And then we get, of course, to the opening climax in uh, Acts chapter 2. Pentecost. Still a very Jewish stage. Yes, there are people coming from different places, but it's devout Jews from every nation. At this point, mingling with the Gentiles, mingling with those who are not Jewish, you might have seen this movie, mingling with the Gentiles is somewhat inconceivable. As you read through early Acts, you can see this, and we think that Luke is intentionally trying to set the stage for something different that's about to happen. It's inconceivable that things are about to change. Jesus, is this the time when you will restore to Israel? Mm -mm. So how do we get from here, Jerusalem, this stage that's very much Jewish, Peter's famous sermon, this bold sermon. How do we get from here, the start of Acts, where is the the play going to end if we're just looking at the book of Acts? We end up in Rome. We start in Jerusalem, Judaism, Jewish center. We end up in Rome, one of the most religiously diverse places in the world at the time, a hustle and bustle of different religious identities, all grappling for different space. To speak, to proclaim, to perform their rituals, to process, to pray, to understand, to ask about theology, to ask about philosophy. How do we get from Jerusalem to Rome? Or we might say, Arabia. Who goes to Arabia? Paul. How do we know that? Paul tells us in his letter to the Galatians. What's he doing in Arabia? Well, we don't know, of course. Who is he talking to? Is that a missing piece that would be, oh, it would be exciting to, to find something about? Or we might say India. Allegedly, the gospel of Jesus Christ is spread to India in the very first century through the apostle Thomas. So although scripture might direct us to Rome in the book of Acts, we also know that it's spreading north, south, east and west. Into different contexts where different questions are being asked of the people who go and talk about Jesus. How do we get from there to there? It's through encounters. People going, they're on the road, they're traveling, they're talking. Not just the apostles, but those who have heard the gospel message, the merchants, the artisans, the soldiers. And they are talking with people. Like you might not see this question. You know the Sunday school or the, uh, the, the children's time when the kids just know the answer is Jesus. Yeah, you've seen that. They just know it's Jesus. It doesn't matter what the question is. We imagine these, these apostles on the road and they're just ready. Whatever question you have, the answer is Jesus. But of course what they don't know, what they don't know are the questions that they're going to be asked. In the context of Judaism, the questions will be framed in a certain way. Language like Messiah makes sense there. But when you go into the into the community of Gentiles, don't talk about Messiah. What what does that even mean? It's, It's a different frame of reference. They don't know the questions that are being asked. What I am not doing is saying that. The birth of the church is formed only in these encounters that happen uh, after the resurrection. The people already have enough that send them out there in the first place. They have enough of the story. They've given their, their whole rest of their lives to proclaiming the story. And yet it's that proclamation that is is molded on the anvil of those theological discourses that take place in the midst of the encounters. As different people from India to Arabia to wherever ask questions from their own context. Well, we understand God in this way. Help us understand from your way. So just very quickly, we might understand the apostles encountering people who are following the tradition of Isis. And her great story of being in Egypt. But this has spread right in and through to to Rome 
All around this area you will see uh, areas devoted to the goddess Isis. Her brother, also her husband, we won't get into that, has been killed by the evil god Set and is scattered around. What does Osiris do? One of the stories is that she gets into a papyrus boat and travels on the River Nile. Oh, River Nile? We have something about River Nile and, and papyrus boats. Travels around, get, collects the pieces of her beloved, brings him back to life. It's a resurrection story. What happens when they are reconciled? Well, they do what husbands and wives do. They have a baby. Horus. We know that the iconography that comes from early Christian artwork is taken directly from the goddess Isis. Or, sorry, from the tradition of Isis. Should that worry us? Well, it's just it's curious. As the disciples are going, if they encounter people from the, with worshipping of, of, of Isis and Osiris and Horus, who were talking about resurrection stories, how interesting would that conversation be? We have something to say about resurrection too. It's not a new word. Buddhism. I'll leave this one. We'll get to this when we talk about Buddhism. But we know that the early church fathers recognized the presence of Buddhism in this context. We don't learn about that in our history classes, by the way, because we have little too little time. Peter encounters Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. He goes, of course, he's had that vision of all the animals coming down. He finds it a very puzzling vision. It's a dream, and how he interprets it matters. It's going to change the world, quite literally. How he interprets it, even though he's puzzled by it. By the time he gets to Cornelius' house, when he gets to Cornelius' house, what's the first thing that, that Cornelius does? He bows down to him, wants to worship him. What does that tell us? It tells us that there is an idea, a conception, that people think that the gods, whoever they may be, might be present and walking with us at any moment at their choosing. Peter could have played on that for a little bit, but he didn't. No, 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 you misunderstand. Let me share. This is a conversion narrative. It's a conversion of Cornelius and his household, but Newbegin will be the one who says it's also a conversion of Peter himself. As he sees what's happening. Because he knew that before that to enter into the household of Cornelius and to eat with him was illegal. We are not to do this. But it's that interpretation of the dream. What God has made clean you will not call profane. Talking about food. And now here he is, he's interpreted it as, hey, God has made something new. From the profane to something new. Allowing him to engage in this encounter Eat together. Oh, folks in Jerusalem are not happy. They're not happy. What have you been doing? We've heard what you've been doing. Eating with the Gentiles. Well, he was a God-fearer. It doesn't matter. Do these laws mean nothing to you? Things are changing. What do we do with this? And we could go elsewhere in Acts as well. When Paul and... Uh, Barnabas, uh, there's a, the, the, folks, the folks think that he is, this is Zeus and this is Hermes. The, the temple uh, of Zeus is there and the priest from the, from the temple believes this is Zeus and Hermes come to be with them. Because again, why not expect the gods to be there in very human form? Let's make sacrifices to them. Paul's having to say, no, 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 no. Interesting that they call uh, Barnabas Zeus and uh, Paul Hermes. I'm not sure he would have been happy about that. <laughs> it's, all, it's all going off. Acts chapter 11. We get into this, this Gentiles. Uh, Gentile very loosely being non-Jewish. Uh, Gentiles coming. They're, they're, they're starting to be interested in the message of, G- of Jesus. This gospel proclamation. They're asking their questions. And they're coming in their droves. Wait a minute. We wanted to keep this stage in a particular way. The way we set it up. It's not possible because it's out there now. People are being inspired by the message. 
And they're coming to it with their new questions. And these theologians are having to grapple and say, well, let's not talk about Jesus as the Messiah. Let's call him Kyrios. Ah, that's a word that fits in this context. I don't understand Messiah. What do the disciples do? They have to make a decision. <laughs> what do we do with all these people? Are these new, these Gentiles coming into discipleship to follow Jesus? Must they be circumcised according to our laws? Must they eat the same things that we eat? Must they look like we eat? Surely yes. Because we know what we know. We know what God wants. Well, they come and what do they do? They study scriptures together. They study the book of Amos. They pray together. They spend time diligently asking these questions because the answers to these questions are going to be seismic. And in the end, James comes out and proclaims, no, the Gentiles do not have to be circumcised. They do not have to look like us. They do not have to sound like us. We do not have to shape them and fashion them in our own image. This has happened because of what's been happening in the midst of interreligious encounters in a whole variety of different ways. They have to come back, and I love their recourse back to Scripture, to trust one another and to trust that the Holy Spirit is guiding that conversation in allowing them to proclaim. Now those folks can get back out on the road and go back to those encounters and say, here's what, here's what we've decided. This is what we think God is telling us is the best way forward. And in this process, the church is being formed. I'll skip that one. Last couple of slides. This is the temple of Artemis, the daughter of Zeus and Leto. Uh, it's one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It's in Ephesus. Uh, it's no longer there. You see, you see some remnants. Uh, Paul goes to Ephesus. Do you think he knows this temple exists? You can't miss it. It's just the seven wonders of the natural world, of the ancient world. Yeah? He's coming in with this new message. Folks, folks are trying to say, well, oh, we've got our space carved out here. And look at our beautiful temple. And here's Paul trying to proclaim the gospel. In Acts chapter 19, we're told that, you, that, that Paul, as is his wont, goes out. He goes to the synagogue. He wants to connect there first. And that's another conversation for us. But he connects there and then some like what he says and others say, no, thank you very much. Because those questions about Jewish and followers of Jesus' identity is, is a tricky one for a whole new lecture series. Worth it, though. <laughs> but here's Paul. And it's a, it's a verse we would probably never hear from the pulpit. Paul leaves the, the synagogue in Ephesus and on his way... You know, we think about Paul being on the move all the time. He stops in Tyrannus. And we're told that he lectures there every day for how long? Two years. Two years? He should be moving somewhere else. No, he chooses to stay and he debates. And he debates folks who are coming in from all over this region to the temple of Artemis. And for other reasons too. Let me posit this to you. Is the Paul who begins on his first day in the lecture hall, ready to go with a gospel proclamation, is it the same Paul that leaves two years later? Well, it's the same Paul. But what's happened in that two years as he debates people with some of the greatest philosophical and theological questions that we could imagine at that time? We can imagine that Paul some days goes home and says, why didn't I say that? Numbskull. Why, did I, why, was, why was I so clumsy with my words? Other days we imagine he was on fire. The Holy Spirit filled him and he was just able to get the words right. Maybe persuade some, maybe influence some. But I would hazard a guess that it's not the same Paul who leaves two years later. Why? Because he's had these incredible experiences. I would hazard a guess that the Paul who leaves has had his, his Christian identity, his understanding of Christ and who therefore he is, sharpened to the point where he can proclaim that message in a way that is 
better. It's, it's much, more, much more well thought out. Because he's grappled with it every day. Listening to new questions. Going back to his colleagues. To the tent makers. Saying, this is what this guy said. I've got to see him again tomorrow. What am I going to say? Let's go back to scriptures. Let's think about what Jesus said. Let's think about some of those stories. This is what I'll say. Goes back out there. There's a beautiful movement that takes place there. Into the lecture hall and back. And it's from there that Paul is able at the same time to be writing to others. To say, let me help you, let me encourage you. But he doesn't bury his head in the sand and say, if you don't like it, I'm gone. Friends, I believe that's 11 o'clock. We're going to go on a journey this next six weeks. Next week we're going to look at Hinduism, Christian encounters with Hinduism. And ask the question, how in the midst of those encounters... Has Christian mission been challenged? Just like Paul going into that lecture hall. How has the encounter with Hinduism, with Hindus, challenged the theological questions that are asked that allow us to engage better then with people from this tradition? Thank you all for being here today. I look forward to seeing you with you next week. Thank you.